He wasn't a trained boxer, just a college student who wanted to do something nice to give back to the community. But the match went extremely wrong, and it's still unclear who's to blame. This is the story of Nathan Valencia, the Las Vegas fraternity brother who died in a charity fight night. Hi friends, I'm Katie, and this is Katie Does Crime. Thank you for joining me for the first time if you're new here, and hello to the usual rapscallions and reprobates. Please consider subscribing or joining me on Patreon if you'd like to hear more true crime stories. Fight Night at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, was an annual fraternity event for charity. It was known to be dangerous, and that was part of the appeal. If you end up in the hospital, it just shows how hard you went for charity. The flyers around campus advertising the event said no experience required, which meant total novices would sometimes sign up to box. And that was actually part of the plan, according to one Fight Night participant. The frat assumed that if the boxers didn't have much experience, they couldn't hurt each other as badly. 20-year-old Nathan Valencia from Las Vegas was a member of the Sigma Alpha Epsilon fraternity at UNLV, a junior who was well-liked and well-known. That might be why the sponsors of Fight Night made him part of the main event. He wasn't a trained fighter, nor really the type of guy who ever beefed with anyone at all. In fact, his frat brothers called him a true gentleman. He would do you a favor or give a listening ear whenever you needed it. He didn't really even believe in that whole rival fraternities thing. He just wanted to do something nice for charity. But both Nathan's mom and his girlfriend tried to convince him to cancel his participation in fight night. He was the baby of the family to his mom and a sweetheart to his girlfriend of almost two years. When Lacey Foster first met him, she says she texted all of her friends, guys, I'm going to marry this man. They were both kinesiology students studying how the human body moves in the hope of helping patients with their mobility. But his love for his mom and his girlfriend wouldn't be enough to make him drop out of the fight. He was the main event and he couldn't let anyone down. Nathan found a frat brother who would train with him and they went to the boxing gym nine times in the month leading up to fight night. There's a lot of cardio involved and they got to spar with the other people in the session. Nathan even stopped drinking and smoking in preparation. So when he and his girlfriend arrived at the Sahara Event Center, a little northeast of the Wynn if you know Las Vegas, he was probably in the best shape he'd been in in a while. It was November 19th, 2021. Nathan's girlfriend says that something seemed not quite right from the beginning when they walked in and saw some trash sitting in the corner of the event hall and had to use a cluttered old warm-up room. It seemed a little unprofessional. The ring and the equipment and the women with the round cards all looked right, but Nathan and his girlfriend didn't have a great feeling about how well-planned it was overall. There were no coaches, just friends to cheer them on, but it's not like Nathan was going to back out now. He was in the last of nine fights that night, three rounds consisting of three minutes, unless someone wasn't able to fight back before that. Nathan looked a little worried as the MC said his name in that long, drawn-out way MCs do, but he at least looked the part in his black shorts, purple jacket, and red headgear. Ambitions as a Fighter by Tupac, a song that I'm sure you can tell I'm not familiar with by the way I'm pronouncing it like the farm girl I am, played over the loudspeaker as Nathan's rival was announced. His name was Emmanuel, and he was also a junior like Nathan, a finance major, an aspiring DJ. They had met once before, a few days earlier, at a frat event, but there wasn't any trash talking or threats made. This was a good-natured event for charity, after all. Emmanuel looked confident in a way that Nathan didn't, but he was just as much of an amateur. Neither of them really landed any decent hits in the ring at the beginning, more like just hit each other on the top of the head or on the legs, which you're not allowed to do in boxing. Nathan got the whistle blown on him when he repeatedly hit the back of Emmanuel's neck. Oh yeah, you can see that they're both not trained. At least not very well. We asked Donovan Britt to watch the video too. Britt is a martial arts instructor and the owner of Las Vegas Krav Maga. He's trained hundreds of fighters, private security, and police officers. Britt sees three red flags that the boxing official in the ring did not act on. The first was Valencia turning and running. You see when he's turning and running normally even in an amateur fight, a referee would warn him once about that and tell him, if you turn and run away again, it's a, it, he's going to stop it. Which Valencia did, but nothing happened. Second, Valencia's rubbery legs and staggered walking during the third round. His balance seems to be impacted a little bit right now. I'm watching his legs. Uh -huh. He looks like he's on rubber legs a little bit, and that, that's a little concerning. Third was the repetitive shots to Valencia's head. Another shot that he took. Another shot, another shot. Referee should have stepped in and, and, and at least give him a standing eight count to see if he was okay. Britt says the fight should have been about fighter safety, and it wasn't. That, to me, uh, screams a guy that doesn't know what he's doing as an official. 
uh, and it also screams, um, it's not the fighter's fault. But his opponent didn't do anything to him that caused his death as far as maliciously or with ill intent. I don't, I don't see anything in that video that indicates that. As they got more tired, they became worse fighters. Rolling Stone writes, the two threw random blows, their movements sloppy and imprecise, the frenzied strokes of a parking lot brawl. After several blows to the head while backed into a corner, Nathan looked like he was done for. The wind completely knocked out of him, almost unable to stand on his own two feet. His girlfriend says you could see that he was just trying to get away to catch a breath. Nathan held himself up by the ropes. His girlfriend said it looked like he was slipping out of consciousness. And then he sat down and couldn't get back up. He wasn't with them anymore. 911 was called. Spectators rushed forward, and a woman who said she was a nurse pulled Nathan's body away from the side of the ring by his ankles to keep him away from the crowd. The EMTs who arrived said that the friends and frat brothers surrounding him were so trashed from drinking between the nine fights that they couldn't even coherently articulate Nathan's name. This apparently included the frat's medical staff. Nathan Tyler Valencia was in a coma for three days before his life support was removed. A surgeon said that even if he lived through a procedure, he would be a vegetable forever. He died on November 23, 2021, and those 10 minutes in the ring altered his family's life forever. A subdural hematoma, which is usually caused by a head injury, had filled the space between his skull and brain with blood. His cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head, and it was ruled a homicide, but an accidental one. It wasn't considered a crime. The Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department said in a statement, although Mr. Valencia's death is tragic, the circumstances surrounding his death are not criminal and no charges will be filed. And that's when the questions and concerns about fight night really emerged. This was an event that had been going on for 10 years and had raised over $100,000. But fighters in past years had been sent to the hospital after their bouts, and yet no paramedics had been on call at the event this year. The referee had been called in as a favor because the hosting fraternity couldn't find anyone else. He was apparently the older brother of someone in the fraternity and didn't have any training, certainly not the year of training that's required for amateur fights. To add insult to injury, the ref was allegedly caught on video drinking before the event. The event was unlicensed when it should have been approved and overseen by the Nevada Athletic Commission, which would have required proper medical personnel for anything involving unarmed combat. The chairman of the Nevada Athletic Commission said that the University of Nevada and its president had some explaining to do. The president, for his part, said that they would look at how off-campus events like these can be as safe as possible. The university and the national organization suspended the UNLV Kappa Sigma chapter the following month as investigations were ongoing. The attorneys for Nathan's parents called it a step in the right direction, but they felt that someone needed to be held responsible for what happened. The Las Vegas police had said that there was no criminality on the part of the venue where the event was held, but nearly a year later in August 2022, the Nevada Athletic Commission released a 158-page report on the matter, and they said that the police had been too definitive in their initial statement and that it had been premature to say no crime had been committed. One member of this panel that reviewed the incident said that this was an underground, illegal fight that can't happen again. Because boy, even if there had been medical oversight, the event just sounds rough. A fraternity brother who fought in an earlier match said that no rules were ever explained to them. His ill-fitting headgear would become lopsided during the fight. And in a video one of the spectators recorded, you hear a woman yelling, fix his headgear. It's not the ref who notices. In fact, when someone screamed to stop the fight, the ref just ignored it. People said the event was chaotic at best. And of course, in the aftermath of the event, there were questions about whether Nathan's opponent, Emmanuel, had fought in good faith. People claimed that he was under the influence or that his gloves were weighted to cause more harm to Nathan. Emmanuel's stepfather has nothing but understanding for the people circulating these rumors. He said, if Emmanuel died, we would maybe be thinking the same thing. Emmanuel's lawyers said they never attempted to hinder the investigation. They were just never asked to help. The attorney general didn't contact him until five months later, and no one ever asked to examine Emmanuel's gloves. Emmanuel sent Nathan a supportive text after the fight and even went to visit him, but Nathan's friends asked him to leave the hospital. He didn't go to the funeral because he worried he would draw too much attention. Nathan's family made a wrongful death lawsuit against the university, the fraternity that hosted the event, the untrained referee who was allegedly drinking before the fight, and the venue that held it. They said there were improper safety protocols and inadequate equipment, and that the university knew about the injuries in previous years and yet did nothing to prevent them, basically providing no oversight in off-campus events. In their suit, the family claims that Nathan suffered intense physical and mental pain, 
disfigurement, shock, and agony, and that they have been deprived of the estate that he would have accumulated over his lifetime. I'm not sure how they would know he was shocked if he was in a coma, and I didn't know you could sue for the money a person might have made in the future, but please let me know if that seems normal to you in the comments. In September 2022, the university offered the family $150,000 as a settlement, but the family's lawyer said they would decline because the university hadn't taken any steps to ensure this sort of thing wouldn't happen again. I can see how that amount might have felt very insignificant compared to their son's life, but the university's public affairs director said that 150 k is the max a state agency can offer in a civil case. The university's argument seems to be that Nathan must have had some sort of pre-existing condition. After all, symptoms of a subdural hematoma can include terrible headaches, and Nathan had complained to his girlfriend of severe headaches after his training sessions leading up to the fight. So maybe he had an injury before the fight. And anyway, this wasn't remotely a university-sanctioned event, they said. Some of the boxers weren't even UNLV students. I looked up this court case, and it looks like the defendant made a motion to dismiss in April 2022, along with a demand for a jury trial. Then in June 2022, the court ordered a dismissal without prejudice, which I take to mean that there was something in the complaint that needed correction. Now it appears that a jury trial has been scheduled for May 2024. I'll keep an eye out for any updates. If there's a little good news that's come out of this, in December 2021, the State Athletic Commission named a new rule, Nathan's Law. The commission declared that it now has authority over unarmed events for charity like the one Nathan Valencia died at. They had oversight for similar contests and exhibitions, but charity events had been basically loopholed out. The commissioner said, It's disturbing and heartbreaking that different entities find unarmed combat to be something of fun and entertainment. I don't think people realize what this is, how dangerous it is, and how it's not appropriate in any way without major oversight, regulation, and approval from people who know what they're doing. So at least there's that. And now, some words about who Nathan was as a person. His girlfriend started a GoFundMe campaign that raised over $83,000 for the family to pay off medical and funeral expenses. Here's what she wrote there. Nathan Tyler Valencia was someone who made an impact on anyone he met. Nathan had a smile that lit up every room he walked into. I was lucky enough to cross paths with Nathan and share what felt like a lifetime of love and laughter. The love we shared was like no other. Nathan was the kind of person who put others before himself. Anyone who knows him could see how much he cared and loved for his family, friends, and myself. I was truly my best and happiest self when I was with him. The impact he made on not only my life, but everyone else's, is unmatched. He taught me love, strength, loyalty, and genuine happiness. There is nothing he wouldn't do for me, and there's nothing I wouldn't do for him. Nathan was never not smiling. Whether he was out with friends, at a festival, at the gym, or playing video games, there was always a smile on his face that radiated throughout the room. Not only was Nathan a large part of my life, he was a son, brother, and friend to many. Nathan was actively a member of Sigma Alpha Epsilon at UNLV. He had so much love for his chapter and valued the genuine connections he was able to make. Nathan passed away on November 23rd at the young age of 20. Although Nathan is not here with us physically, his spirit will live on forever through everyone who knows him. Nathan was taken from us too soon, but I know we have gained the best guardian angel. May Nathan rest in peace, and may his family and his loved ones find love and comfort in these difficult times. So do you think the university or the referee or anyone else should be held responsible for Nathan's death? What will a jury say? As always, please let me know what you think in the comments. Thank you for tuning in today. I'm just a true crime fan like you are, and I really appreciate you taking a chance on me. Please like and subscribe to my channel if you like spending this time together. I would be so appreciative. Until next time, I'm Katie, and this has been Katie Does Crime.